So I'm going to talk about do we worship complexity? And the question that I want to talk about is why is software development actually so hard? So when I started programming in the 80s, this is basically what I did. It was just very small programs and basic. Uh, in this case, it's just two lines of code. And this is actually not that hard to do. But the problem that we have in computer science and software development is complexity. And the question is, how do we deal with such complex systems? And the answer to that is modules and architecture. So what you want to do is you want to separate your program into decoupled modules. And each of these modules contain one aspect. It might be a part of the domain logic. It might be a technical aspect. And then what you want to do is you want to understand your system in terms of the architecture, how the system is split into different modules and how they interact with one another. And then you can understand a single module in isolation, maybe to change some code. And you can also modify those modules in isolation. So as a developer, if you want to change some code, you just have to care about one module. And you don't really need to understand a lot of details about the other modules. And then you can understand how the modules interact. And that way the system becomes, you can handle the system because there is just limited knowledge about the system that you need. And what one thing that I like about modules is this idea about how modules should fit in your head. So that's an idea of uh, Daniel Terhorst North. And he basically said, well, they should be a size that, well, your head doesn't explode if you think about them. And this puts the emphasis on understanding modules and making software understandable. Now, Obviously, there are people who are developing software and more often than not, it's actually quite a few people that develop a system. And the problem therefore becomes that no single person can understand such a large system because there are working so many people on that system and, well, it's hard to understand what all of them are doing. So if you want to understand what each of these persons is outputting every day in terms of code, that is just not possible. So you end up with complex software with lots of modules and you end up with complex relationships between them. And I guess that's the main problem that we are facing these days, such complex architectures, complex systems. And we as technical persons, this is actually very, well, it's a horror to work on such systems. So complexity makes us suffer. And therefore, one of the things that we ought to do as technical people is to fight complexity and we should aim to build simple solutions. So we should refactor our code so it becomes the simple solution that actually fulfills the requirement. There are ideas like don't repeat yourself. If you want to copy paste some code and you would repeat the, that code, well, you should refactor un until your system is structured in a way that you can reuse the code and that you just have to implement it once because that's easier. And sort of the golden goal is to even delete code. So as a good developer, if you delete code, if there is less code, that's actually a great thing. However, there is also architecture and there is a complex relation between architecture and organization and people. And this is what Conway's Law is about. So Conway's Law says that architecture copies the communication structure of the organization. So what this means in a way is that the organization and the architecture, well, they are depend on one another. Uh, the architecture is a copy of the organization. That's what Conway says in his uh, law. So we need to think about how the organization actually influences the architecture. And the thing that Conway says here is that if you have some organizational unit, some team, and you have another team and another team, well, those teams will probably build some modules because if they do that, they can, they can be largely independent in terms of what they do as, as development. So they can work on their stuff and they don't have to talk a lot to other teams. Uh, so it, it's sort of natural to build one module because by definition, 
that is a separate piece of the system and you only have to understand little about the system. And then you would negotiate interfaces of your module with other teams and therefore, well, your modules are basically the same as the organization and their communication structure in the organization. Nowadays, this is used differently. So the reasoning is that the architecture, well, is also represented in the organization. So you would start off with some modules, like in this case, and then you would distribute those modules across some teams. And then you are basically using the organization as a tool for architecture. So here is a team and here is another team and another team and you assign specific tasks to them. To them. So you say that those, these are people who are working on order processing and they might give some requirements to another team uh, that is working on shipping. And these are actually patterns that we have in domain driven design. So the pattern that one team gives some requirements to another team, that's the customer supplier pattern in domain driven design. And therefore the order processing has the priority, maybe because it's the source of revenue. And once you do that, teams will probably build modules. So in a way what you decided is that there will be an order module, there will be a shipping module, there will be an invoicing module, because it's natural that teams will, well, work in this way. And this kind of organization, how the teams are set up, that has to be defined because you have to have some organization that uh, talks about how those teams should interact. So this is actually the most cost grained architecture decision that you make. And here's a problem because managers actually work on organization. So the organization influences the architecture or is pretty much the same as the architecture. So maybe architects are managers or managers are architects. And in real life, this is often a problem because it means that architecture decisions are made by managers and they might not even be aware of the fact that they're making such decisions. But on the other hand, it means that the organization is also a tool for architecture. Setting up the organization is one way to influence the architecture. And this is something that you have in domain driven design, as I said before, and it is something that we talk a lot about if you look at microservices and how you build systems there. So basically what I'm trying to say here is somehow the organization has to be defined, but one point here is you shouldn't put people in those boxes, in those teams, and then expect them to follow mindlessly. So you have to be aware of the fact that people have their own opinions and they just won't follow that, that plan that you made, maybe. Uh, quite often, reorganizations are just ignored by the people who are being reorganized. So this idea of just setting up a diagram in the organization and then people will follow that diagram, you have to be careful because that might just not work because, well, people don't follow those rules mindlessly. But still, it is something where you can try to influence people, where you can try to set up meetings where people talk to one another and such meetings will influence how people talk to one another and that will influence interfaces because interfaces between modules, well, that is something that people talk about. As I said, this is something that is called Conway's Law and Mel Conway, who originally came up with this law, is actually on Twitter, uh, quite active still. And there is a paper that he wrote about it. Uh, the paper is called How Do Committees Invent? And this paper is one of the papers that you should probably read and try to understand because it's actually quite interesting. So let's do a deep dive about this paper and what it actually says. So in the next few slides, I'm just going to present what the paper says. So don't shoot the messenger, uh, shoot the author if you want to shoot anyone. And what the paper says is, well, if there are lots of people in your project, there will be lots of modules. And the manager of such a system, well, the prestige of that manager depends on the size of the team, the budget, that he or she is responsible for. And also, if you have a large team, then there is a potential excuse, which is, well, even this 
large team wasn't able to solve this specific problem. So a manager is well incentivized to strive for a large team and a large budget, even if the project is small. So what the paper says is, well, if you have such a team, what the manager will aim for is to have an even larger team. And now you could say, well, why would I care? I'm a technical person and those additional people would just do nothing. Uh, so they, they will sit, be sitting somewhere and it cost some money for, for the company, but I don't necessarily care. However, that's wrong because there is a law called Parkinson's law and that is also something that uh, Conway says in his paper. And Conway's law is an explanation for something that is quite weird. So if you look at the colonial office of the British Empire, well, obviously the number of colonies uh, decreased during the time. However, the number of employees increased. So the maximum number of employees in that um, office was present when there were no colonies left. And that's weird, right? Because there is no work whatsoever once the colonies are gone. So why is that? Well, the reason is that officials want subordinates, not rivals. And therefore, such officials will create work for one another. This is what Parkinson, Parkinson's law says. So what you will do is you will try to get more people reporting into you, subordinates. You don't want to have rivals and then you will start creating work for one another. And the typical number of employees that you can expect to, to be hired is plus five to 7% per year. And it doesn't really depend on the work. So if you look at the Wikipedia article, this is what it says. And even if there is no work, you will still have an increase of employees. So what Parkinson's law actually says is the work will expand so as to fill the time of all the people available for its completion. So those people that you hire, that the manager will hire, they will actually work on the problem. So you will have all these people in the organization and they will somehow, well, talk to one another. You will have some communication across uh, between them and eventually communication will fail because there are just too many communication relationships, too much communication going on. And what Conway's law now says is, well, this is also represented in the architecture. So you will have a lot of modules. You will have a lot of dependency between those modules and therefore the architecture will be complex and you will end up in a quite bad state, which is a very complex architecture, a lot of people working on it. And this is a very unpleasant place to be. Because the manager is aiming for his or her prestige for a large team, and because Parkinson's law says all of them will do at least some work, the communication will fail. And then Conway's law says the architecture is also complex and you will end up in a quite bad state. And this is what Conway said in 1968. So it is actually something that we know for quite a long time. The paper that Conway came up with is actually older than me. So large projects are, well, costly, risky, might have a bad architecture. And this Parkinson's law and Conway's law, those two laws together, they explain why this is the case. And I think that's an interesting uh, thing to understand because more often than not, those large projects actually do have some problems. So you could argue that managers in a way worship complexity. They don't really do that as in they, they aim for a complex project. It's just that because they aim for prestige, they end up in a situation where they have a large complex project at their hand. So it's not that they're aiming for complexity. It's just that this is what happens because of what they are doing. But developers, technical people like me, they will probably not worship complexity because at the end of the day, this is something where we suffer. I have to admit that I don't like this idea because it basically says, well, without a manager, everything is fine. And I don't like that idea at all because managers are generally doing a great job. And it is something that we should be able to use. And also I'm going to talk about how developers are actually worshiping complexity. So here is a thought experiment. 
Let's imagine that I'm standing there and say, well, I just developed a new system. It's a simple job application. Probably no one would care. Now I could go on and say, well, this actually makes a lot of money and still no one would care because from a technical standpoint, this is just very uh, irrelevant. Java applications, it's an old technology, so why would anyone care? However, if I say, well, here is a microservices system and I'm using CQS, which is a technology to split the command, the write part of the system from the query, the read part of the system, so it's command query responsibilities aggregation. So I'm using that pattern, which is quite modern. I'm using event sourcing, which allows me to uh, recreate the state of the system by just looking at the events and reprocessing those events. I'm using a modern uh, technology such as Kafka. I'm using Kubernetes, which is another modern technology. I'm using a service mesh like Istio. Well, this is actually great and it is something that you could easily submit as a conference talk. Now, if I say, well, this doesn't provide any business value, nobody would care because it's a modern and very up-to-date application. Or I could say, well, here is a highly scalable system and it is using NoSQL, it's using cloud, all those technologies that we use to have highly scalable systems. Again, it is something that we would, well, celebrate because it's impressive. However, maybe I don't have any users whatsoever. And this is again, quite an odd situation because the scalability only matters if I have a lot of users. So actually I sort of missed the point entirely. And I came across this tweet not too long ago. And what this tweet says is, well, developers expect complexity. So if you give a developer a simple project, they would first complicate it to something that makes them comfortable. And if developers have no problem to solve at all, they will probably create some. So I think that's quite interesting. So we do have a problem here. And the problem is that business people do care about business value but engineers probably don't. And I have to admit that I started software development because I love engineering and I love software development. And of course, doing complex engineering is more challenging and some people consider it therefore more fun. And it also provides more prestige. It is something that gives you uh, the, the, the chance to do some talks at some conferences. So I would actually argue that developers worship complexity too. And talking about it, it's actually more than just worshiping. So let me put you through a thought experiment. So my recommendation for some customer was to use continuous delivery, to use cloud. And what the customer said was, well, that won't work here. And I said, well, you know, it works at Google, Amazon, it works at a number of places. So why wouldn't it work at, at your place? Well, and what that person said is, well, maybe it works for Google and Amazon, but our system is more complex. Okay, so let's look at the numbers and it turns out that it's not too easy to figure out how complex Google actually is. So in 2015 and 2016, that's some numbers that I could actually research. It was a two billion lines of code. It were 25,000 engineers on the payroll and 2.5 million servers. You could argue about each of these metrics, whether they really indicate complexity, but I would be pretty surprised if what these people are working on was more complex than, than this. And therefore there is something that I would call the complexity fallacy. And the complexity fallacy is from far away, everything is easy, uh, even Google. I mean, if I look at Google, it's just that one page where you say, okay, this is what I'm searching for. You enter some terms and then there is another web page with some results. And I'm pretty certain that there is a lot of stuff going on in the background. Like there is the web crawler and obviously there is uh, people are, there is search engine optimization. So there is a whole business that tries to m make Google aware of specific web pages and so on and so on. So there is a lot of stuff going on. So I would argue that you don't really know what other, that those systems like Google in that case, so they do appear easy, but really they aren't. And the same is true for all of my insurances, for example. My insurance is basically, I pay a certain amount of money and you know once I'm sick or once I, I need a lawyer, I get some money back. So how hard could it be? Well, talk to someone who's actually working on software, 
for insurances and you will notice that it's really really complex it's, and again it's the same thing from far away it looks quite easy but if you look at it more closely then you figure out it's actually quite complex so if you look at all the details well everything is complex and the fantasy i think is a result of the fact that you know your system very well so it appears complex uh, even if you compare it to google and this is different if you would look at the details so once you work at google you will notice how complex that system really is and once uh, you work at an insurance you will notice how complex that system actually is and i think the point here is that complexity in this case was a great excuse it was a great excuse to say well the system that we're working on here it's really complex so there is no way that what you're suggesting would work so we don't really need to care about it at all it's just a waste of time so in conclusion i think managers worship complexity developers also worship complexity and the reason for that is prestige but complexity is also an excuse it's an excuse to not try harder and to fight complexity so my suggestion would be to avoid complexity to remember the goals that you're working towards and to do a boring job so that Java application might actually be enough to solve your business problem. And then you should probably write that Java application and then you won't have a complex system to care about. So it is something that also makes your life easier. Which in a way says don't care about prestige because if you want to have those prestigious complex projects, that's going to be, well, hard. So this will lead to a better, less stressful life and it will lead to business success. Or maybe at the end of the day, you're building a complex system for a good reason. That might also be the case. However, I have to admit that most of the systems that I see in the business domain are usually uh, complex for other reasons, not because the business domain is so very complex. If you enjoyed the talk, um, here is an entry in, in my blog over at innoq.com uh, where I detail that in well more detail. And there is also a German version of that a blog entry. So if you want to look at that, that's also, I think, a great source of that information. I hope you enjoyed the talk and um, have a great day.